Now let's talk on the topic dry eyes. The tears. What are tears? Let's look at a layer of tears. So if this is a drop of tears, we'll take a cross section and look at what it consists. First, we have the oily layer, which is made up of lipids. Next, we have an aqueous layer. We have a mucin layer, which has particulate matter, which will come eventually into the aqueous layer also. So these are the three layers. Now let's take a look at each layer. First, the oily layer. And remember the gland which secretes the oily layer? It's the meibomian glands, which are present on the tarsal plate, and the, actually on the palpebra. So what it does is, since it's an oily layer, it retards the evaporation of the tear film. And also, it draws the water into the tear film and thickens the aqueous layer. So it will cause water to accumulate because of the lipid being uh, hydrophobic, it will cause the water to accumulate like this in the middle. Now, if there is a problem in this, it is going to cause evaporative dry eyes because now the water is not accumulating properly and it doesn't have this protective layer to prevent the evaporation. Actually, it retards, not prevents. Lubricate eyelashes as it passes over the surface of the globe. Now, as you can understand, it will lubricate from its location itself. It is going to cause lubrication of the eyelashes as it passes over the surface of the globe. Next, the aqueous layer. That is the water layer and it is the thickest. Now, when you say it's the water layer, it doesn't mean it is just water. It has several functions. It brings in oxygen because the cornea that is avascular. There's no blood vessels. So the cornea depends on two locations. So here's the cornea, which I'll draw in green. It needs oxygen to diffuse like this or from the anterior chamber, from the aqueous fluid. Next, it has immunoglobulin A. IgA molecules, lysozymes, and lactoferrin. These are basically antibacterial. And in the sense, they are defensive structures. And also, let's say the cornea is not really perfectly smooth. The aqueous layer will come and fill this gap. This is important for light refraction. For the accommodation reflect, reflex, you need a proper cornea because if not if the light okay let's take a look at light which strikes against this impaired this uh, irregular surface of the cornea this will deviate this way this will deviate this way and this can lead to different problems one of them is called astigmatism we'll learn about astigmatism in a late lecture, it's important to keep the continuous nature of the cornea. Next, it washes away debris. So the tears will take out any matter that comes and falls on the surface of the eye. It will drain it and it will go to the nasolacrimal drainage system, eventually leading to the mouth and in, from the mouth to the stomach. And you know what's present in the stomach to destroy these stuff. You have the acids, the HCl acid. And then also, if there's a problem in this, it can be due to hyposecretive. That means there's a decreased secretion of the aqueous layer, and this is secreted by the lacrimal glands. So if there's a defect in the secretion by these lacrimal glands, then the aqueous layer is mainly affected. There's a defect in the secretion by the meibomian glands, then there's going to be evaporative dry eyes. 
and finally the inner mucin layer now let's take a look at this here's the cornea and here is the sclera and if this is the sclera there's going to be the conjunctiva the bulbar conjunctiva which will be present on the surface of the, the sclera and it has these goblet cells so what happens is the goblet cells they will produce this mucin and if this layer is deficit it can be due to both hyposecretive and evaporative states now what what is the importance of this mucin layer it converts the corneal epithelium from a hydrophobic to a hydrophilic surface what does that mean it allows the interaction of the water with the corneal surface if not it will be hydrophobic and it will accumulate like this on the surface of the cornea so to prevent that to cause even spread that is one way the other way is there is villus like structures on the surface of the cornea which helps hold the liquid so when we learn the okay uh, epithelia of the cornea we will learn that now next let's take a look at the drainage pathway again so the lacrimal sac okay sorry the lacrimal glands produce the aqueous layer the different uh, sub the different organs will produce the different layers of tears and it will cover the whole eye with the movement of the eye, uh, the eyelids then we have our puncta which are the openings to the canaliculi the lacrimal canaliculi which opens to a lacrimal sac which opens to a nasolacrimal duct and finally into the nasal cavity that is the pathway of tears three factors are needed for effective resurfacing of the tear film that is spreading the tear film properly first one is the normal blink surface and the next one is congruity between the external ocular surface and the eyelids that means there should be a continuous flow in the tears across the external ocular surface and through the eyelids from in the inner surface of the eyelids and finally the epithelia the corneal epithelia must be normal so if you don't have these structures i just talked about or if it is hydrophobic due to the low mucin layers it can cause a defect dry eye is the disease which can be caused by any of these uh, layers having an issue so now let's talk about dry eye as the name says the tear film is supposed to stay on the corneal surface almost at all times there must be a continuous film at all times what happens is the film evaporates it's obvious it's a fluid it's made up of water mainly and it evaporates so in a while there will be less of the fluid and also there is going to be drainage so it's a continuous flow but dry eye is when there is excess loss of fluid from the surface of the eyelid and that leads to different uh, symptoms we'll talk about that first the causes of the prevalence of dry eye mainly it is higher in women and in older people one reason for the increased prevalence is because of the increased lifespan of the population due to uh, proper medication and also people tend to drink more medicine so there are medicine which can cause inhibition of secretion of of uh, tears and then also contact lens there's more people preferring to wear contact lens over traditional glasses it's a cosmetic thing and that can actually cause uh, increased risk of dry eye because you need to keep the contact lens maintained properly and also 
in increase of computer and cell phone usage what does that mean people tend to blink less when they are on the computer or on the cell phone and that leads to evaporation so the new tears which come do not get spread evenly it will just evaporate out along with the other tears the tear film present on the surface because of the lower blink rate and also patients undergoing lasik surgery we will talk about this it's type of laser surgery causes the cornea to become non confluent so when it's non confluent it is not able to retain the tear film properly and finally increase in pollution so with pollution there could be blockages we have talked about that in the lac- nasolacrimal section and then the symptoms what i do is this 12 symptoms i just draw an eye and i divide the symptoms like this it's just a way i remember these symptoms for the first one is there's going to be irritation there's no dry there's no um, tears to prevent substances foreign matters coming in uh, even air coming and hitting the surface then with that you will get redness and with redness that means there is inflammation so you get a burning or stinging sensation then you have itchy eyes so try to think of it as a flow next you have a foreign body sensation and then you have a blurred vision now think of it as if a foreign body is present here so blurred vision and when there is a foreign body on the surface of the eye it causes tearing and again there is going to be contact lens intolerance it's a, think of it as a foreign body so when you try to put that on without that surface of tears it is very difficult for the eye to handle that now there is going to be an increase in blinking and also there is going to be more mucus discharge mainly from the conjunctiva and these patients will have photophobia their environment is going to be a factor in this which if there's bright light they tend to try to stay away from that and also in windy when there's more evaporation or ac rooms when there's less humidity these patients have um, severe dry eye or when they're reading for long times or using their computer and other devices mobile devices so these excess a bit uh, dry eye next dry eye affects mostly during the night time because throughout the morning uh, okay you sleep and you are awake in the morning you have a layer of film and as it gradually evaporates the symptoms will gradually worsen throughout the day tear film abnormalities let's take a look at each cause one by one so the first one is let's do it like this tear film abnormalities the second one is tear deficient sorry tear deficient dry eye the next one is evaporative dry eye the next one is chronic allergic conjunctivitis the 
next one is abnormal blinking pattern and finally is the environmental causes so let's take a look at the tear film abnormalities that is the three layers of tears there's the lipid layer there's the aqueous layer and there's the mucin layer so if there's a deficit in those layers then it could lead to dry eye so one situation which can occur is if the tear layer is thin it's supposed to be 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 millimeters and if it is th thinner than that it can cause tear film abnormalities the second one is meibomian gland dysfunction and that can lead to froth in the tear film the next one is so uh, actually I need to go into detail about this one so we'll leave it for now next evaporative dry eye that is mainly because of meibomian gland disease probably due to an obstruction which can actually also lead to a collision. we have discussed this previously lid surface anomalies so if there is a problem in the lid surface in which let's say uh, lagophthalmosis or if something causes blinking to be reduced then you can have evaporative dry so that means the tear film is going to dry earlier and if there is some ocular surface toxicities such as long term use of topical anti-glaucoma medications we'll talk about those medicine but it can cause irritation and cause early drying of the tear film and then when you wear a contact glass contact lens you are going to actually uh, it's going to cause so when you wear the contact lens there's going to be a problem in this evaporation so next an allergic reaction those kind of situations can lead to evaporative dry disease finally okay next we have chronic allergies so if there is chronic allergic conjunctivitis this can lead to a loss of goblet cells which secretes the mucin and this destabilizes the tear film and damages the ocular surface because the cornea is not able to hold the tears properly and it is actually a common cause of dry eye an abnormal blinking pattern this is due to use of work uh, sorry computers for a long time because look at the rate of blinking normally and working on electronic devices then environmental influences so when there's poor air quality or if you work in an ac environment where there's low humidity that means it can lead to dry air and always remember dry eye is not caused by one situation it is caused by multiple situations and let's talk about Sjogren's and non Sjogren's um, dry eye so that's a condition okay let's talk about Sjogren's so this is studied under rheumatology there's a triad dry eyes dry mouth and arthritis so this is under rheumatology there's another one called sika sika is not a triad it's a it's a disease with two symptoms dry eyes and dry mouth so sika is this so keratom let's take a look at uh, Sjogren's okay no non Sjogren's so guys next is neurotrophic keratitis now in that condition there's going to be a decrease in corneal sensitivity keratitis is inflammation of the cornea and it occurs after LASIK surgery or PRK surgery this is called 
photo refractive kerato- keratectomy and also anything such as contact lens wear and diabetes and a condition which is called medicamentosa rhinitis it is when you use these drugs these anti congestive drugs for a long time there's going to be a rebound reaction and that can lead to dry eye then also beta blockers because they inhibit the secretion of tears and psychiatrical that means uh, scarring diseases such as trachoma burns or steven johnson syndrome this is actually a rare disorder of the mucous membrane and skin it is mainly an a reaction against medication now let's take a look at different investigations that you do to check for the tears function that is presence of tears on the surface of the eyelid first you do a tear breakup test it is called tear breakup test but and the way you do it is what you do is you instill this fluorescein dye we come to this word again fluorescein so it's a dye which you inject into the lower phonics of the eyelid so over here you inject this fluorescein dye and then you ask the patient to blink several times so you ask the patient to blink several times i'm not going to draw the eyelashes but basically what you do is you ask the patient to blink several times so that you can spread the film evenly and then what you do is you go behind this light so go behind this light and in front of the light you place a blue uh, cobalt filter paper so a uh, blue cobalt filter paper and then you watch the dye dry out so you are now looking at the eye and then you watch it dry out so what do you mean by drying out at a certain time you will find there are black spots emerging now if these black spots emerge in a time less than 10 seconds that means the tears are drying up faster so that is abnormal next we have this rose bengal staining now what is this dye famous for it is a dye that loves the dead or devitalized that is low water containing epithelial cells so that means it will stain the cells which are poor in water that means there's no water or it stains the cells which are dead and the way it does is is remember this this border is called the limbus let's take a look so the rose bengal test again we place it in the conjunctival sac and after 2 minutes you check under microscope for this presence you may in a early stage of uh, dry eye you can see the dye spread out like this on one side of the limbus but in later stages it can spread like this and in very severe stages okay it won't go that far but it will go like this it will basically spread more that shows there is going to be devitalized epithelial cells or dead cells and finally we have the schirmer's test now what is this schirmer's test it's basically so what you do is you check for both reflex tear sweating sorry tear secretion reflex tear secretion and basal tear secretion depending on the type of test what you do is you either give that patient anesthesia topical anesthesia to numb the eye so that even if you irritate it it is not going to um cause tearing there's no reflex tearing let's go again into this what you do is you take a filter paper there's a special filter paper which has a scale on it and you bend the uh first 5 mm and then we have the scale here so this schirmer's test what you do is 
you can do it actually there are three types but the types we need is without anesthesia or with anesthesia so when it is without anesthesia we are basically irritating the eye by placing this uh, filter paper and when that happens there is going to be excess release of tears and that will cause this to be wet and you can see if you can see it go down like this so if this when you take it out if it is normal it should stain above six millimeters but if it is a dry eye condition it will stain less than six millimeters so if you give it with anesthesia that means you are trying to check the basal secretion you are not the eye is not going to respond to the uh, anesthetic uh, sorry, uh, it won't be responding to the irritation by this paper because of the anesthesia. So we check for the basal rate and if it is less than 3 millimeters, that means this is dry eye. And this is done when we don't have access to these tests, the tear breakup film test mainly. Next, impression cytology. So you can take off a layer of the conjunctival epithelium and then apply cellulose acetate filter paper and observe the specimen to see if there is any signs of squamous metaplasia or if there are any inflammatory cells on the conjunctiva. Next, the dry eye management. So what you can do is, you can either replace, preserve or reduce the... Okay, let me finish drawing this. Replace, tear replacement. then tear preservation and if there's inflammation you can give topical steroids so this is the mainstay of treatment and also you can do some other stuff which helps prevent dry eyes such as not stay in uh, AC environments and stay in a more humid environment tear replacement by some artificial liquid then tear preservation you block the puncta you block the drainage system and then topical steroids fluoromethylone it's a weak corticosteroid and remember what i talked about corticosteroids you only give it for a short time because it can lead to secondary open angle glaucoma there's two types there's closed angle an open angle when it's closed angle the trabecular meshwork is going to be closed by the iris in this situation that's not the case it is the angle is open but there's going to be optic nerve damage and there's going to be glaucoma high intraocular pressure 